Well, good afternoon. Welcome to warm and sunny Atlanta, I think, as Senator Chambliss said this morning. And we're expecting uh, a little more weather activity, which for farmers and ranchers is always a wonderful thing. We love the weather. That's why we take up the profession. We are looking forward to, uh, I think, a pretty good uh, time at this convention, notwithstanding whatever issues the weather may create with uh, some individuals coming in uh, uh, to be on our program. Uh, but our members are pretty much going to all be here, and they were pretty much all not going to leave till after this little system moves through, so we're going to be confined for the duration and take care of our business as an organization. Uh, I try to keep this fairly informal. I don't have much in the way of opening comments. Uh, I think many of you heard my comments this morning uh, at the annual meeting. I could reiterate that uh, the issues I talked about with respect to overregulation mostly by EPA, but they're not the sole culprit, uh, are issues that are of great concern to farmers and that we plan on working on pretty extensively in this, in this year of 2011. Uh, we do have the farm bill to deal with. Uh, all indications are that Chairman Lucas will move a little bit slower than what uh, past Chairman Peterson indicated he was going to do, so the bulk of that debate may occur in 2012, but I think there will be a lot of preparatory work. There will be a lot of work, I think, on behalf of organizations representing producers about what we want that farm bill to look like. We will have some of that work occur here in our delegate session on Tuesday. Uh, we are having our own internal discussion about what's the appropriate way to use scarce dollars uh, with the farm bill. I don't have any predictions about how that's going to come out. Stay tuned. We'll know about that Tuesday afternoon. But our members are cognizant of the budget uh, difficulties we'll face with this farm bill. And they're also cognizant of the current structure and where the deficiencies are there. And, uh, you know, they're going to look at ways to uh, decide uh, uh, the policies that we need to have to move forward uh, for the future. Sort of from a societal standpoint, the uh, critics that have been attacking modern production agriculture uh, are there. Their voices uh, have been getting more strident, louder. Uh, we have more consumers that, who don't understand much about agriculture that are being swayed by some of those uh, discussions and critiques, and that is the purpose of the creation of the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance, which I spoke of this morning. We uh, are moving forward uh, as an organization uh, to do exactly what we said we were going to do. We're going to put together a uh, sustained national program funded at a level that will have an impact on consumers' perception, positive impact. Uh, that process is uh, underway now in terms of developing uh, that, and I expect by the second quarter of 2011 uh, there will be more, uh, more substance, if you will, and, and knowledge about how we're going to move forward and what the particular uh, messages are going to be and where the targeted uh, uh, where the targets are going to be in terms of uh, primarily people who influence consumers. That will probably be the primary target. I do want to point out because there, I know I've had a lot of questions about, well, you know, what are you all going to say about the farm bill? And what are you going to say about ethanol? And what are you going to say about all this other stuff? Well, we're not going to say anything about all that. The uh, alliance uh, will not be doing the traditional policy things. What we're going to, need to do is a communications campaign uh, related to building and maintaining consumer trust in uh, today's American agriculture. Uh, I know you're going to have a lot of questions, so I think I will just uh, close, it, uh, uh, close it here. We are still expecting, by the way, Secretary Vilsack to make it in. Uh, his staff has been monitoring the weather and, and trying to figure out if he can get in and out of here. And right now, uh, we're still expecting Secretary Vilsack to be with us uh, tomorrow afternoon for our closing session. And uh, our keynote speaker, Mike Rowe, also we're expecting him to be here. So uh, all in all, things are looking pretty good. What kind of questions we have? Yes, sir. Ray Henry, AP. About the lawsuit um, that you mentioned today, when do you expect to file that? In which district court, federal, state? And last, um, if you could just explain, you talked about that those um, Chesapeake Bay rules that have been proposed starving agriculture out of that area. What's sort of the nexus between those regulations and the economic harm? What, what specific impacts are you worried about for your members? Well, I'll speak in a general sense. Uh, first, to get the uh, answer to your question, we're ex uh, expecting to file tomorrow, uh, January 10th, uh, in the Federal District Court for the Middle District of Pennsylvania. 
uh, Pennsylvania Farm Bureau uh, will be joining us. We do expect uh, that uh, after some time we'll have some other entities join us in this lawsuit. Uh, our concern has been that the way EPA is uh, proposing to move forward with this uh, diet, if you will, pollution diet or restricting total maximum daily loads, the way they're laying that program out in that essence, uh, it's a pollution diet for the whole Chesapeake Bay, and there will be a tendency, both for economic reasons and also as a result of what we believe are flawed studies uh, that indicate agriculture is this huge problem, and therefore the cost burden is going to come straight down on agriculture in that 64,000 uh, square mile area. And obviously, if you put too much of a cost burden on it, you're not going to have that agriculture occurring there. And so that's been our concern all along. Uh, specifically, though, uh, we believe that uh, EPA moving forward in the manner they are violates the Clean Water Act, uh, and we'll be making the arguments to prove that. And we think that their process is always, has already violated the Administrative Procedures Act. So those will be the things that we will be uh, briefing in the lawsuit. Mr. Stallman, uh, Ron Hayes, Radio Oklahoma Network. Uh, uh, one thing you didn't mention this morning, but I know on the mind of several of your producers, your cattle producer, uh, the eastern livestock situation. Uh, what is Farm Bureau, have you had a chance to have any dialogue with USDA or GYPSA about uh, how they've handled it to this point and, and your thoughts about how maybe to make sure something like this doesn't happen in the future? Well, not specifically. We have not. I mean, we're aware of the situation. We're, uh, you know, aware of the damage, frankly, that will be done to a lot of producers are going to be left hung without getting paid. But, you know, that really falls under the current regulatory structure, and USDA is going to have to deal with that. Uh, we haven't weighed in on that. Uh, I'm not sure. I can't stand up here and tell you that the new proposed GYPSA rules are going to, uh, to uh, help in that particular situation. I don't know. I can't tell you that. Uh, but we haven't engaged in that from an organizational standpoint. Uh, Chris Clayton with DTN. What do you understand from your own resolutions that have been filed are going to be the big uh, pieces of debate uh, on, on Tuesday on the floor? Well, I knew somebody was going to ask me that question, Chris, and, I, and I'll be honest with you, I don't uh, predict uh, commodity prices the weather, the outcome of political races, or precisely what our delegates are going to do. They have a mind of their own. Having said that, I have watched the policy process unfold thus far this year. Uh, we are going to uh, have some discussion about the Farm Bill. And there will be discussion about direct payments versus uh, revenue insurance. Uh, I am hoping, as I said in my annual address this morning, that we do get more specific priorities and sort of direction than what we have now about the choices that are going to have to be made, given the tight budget situation we're in. Uh, it remains to be seen what the delegates will do. I know we've had the discussion and we'll have more discussion on the dairy policy. Uh, that has been a, a, a big element internally, and we had some of the discussion last year at our annual meeting. So, you know, what the new dairy policy should look like uh, also will be discussed. We had uh, uh, thus far some uh, interesting discussions on how to move forward with renewable fuels, ethanol uh, particularly. What do you do with the, with the, uh, the, the blending credit uh, versus infrastructure? Uh, you know, there's two competing schools of thought basically that you need to maintain the blending, the blend credit, you need to maintain the tariff, or the alternative is to, well, let's move those kind of resources into uh, uh, the blend pumps and more infrastructure to uh, increase usage as opposed to, you know, having those credits and tariffs in place. Uh, I expect we'll have some debate on that. Um, I, you know, and, and in a lot of other areas, uh, I am sure we're going to have some discussion. Uh, things like OIE, full uh, uh, in, uh, the the uh, standards uh, related to beef uh, for international trade. Uh, you know, we've had this kind of negotiation that we've done with Korea. We've tried to do with other countries about uh, how do you get beef into their market under the current. Uh, uh, OIE standards. 
versus their desire to have less than full OIE compliance. And so I think we're still interested in maintaining that international standard, which in essence says that if you do have an interim agreement to say provide beef at uh, 30 months or less as, a pull, as opposed to all beef, that still if we're gonna do that at some point you have to have acknowledgement that there should be a date at which those countries will accept full OIE standards, those kind of things. So there, we've had some discussion on that. Uh, immigration, border security, uh, the need for an agricultural guest worker program is obviously still there. Uh, the need for reforming the H-2A program is still there. I think our policy has been pretty strong in those two areas. We have had more discussion about the need to strengthen border security, that that should also be a component of our policy, which I don't know that there's anybody that uh, believes that a country shouldn't be able to control their borders, but we might have some discussion about that. Uh, the reg all of the regulatory issues that, that we're engaged in, uh, we already have pretty good existing policy. Uh, I actually think us filing this lawsuit uh, relative to the Chesapeake Bay situation uh, both carries out existing policy, but also precludes us from having further discussion about uh, more specifics about what we're gonna do in that area because there was a strong, a strong feeling amongst our leaders that the path EPA was going down was not only gonna affect the Chesapeake Bay, but it was gonna affect other watersheds across the country. Uh, that's about all I can think of right now. Uh, I expect it to be an interesting session. It always is. I enjoy chairing it. Uh, and I'm sure our delegates will come up with some topics to talk about that I can't even think about standing up here at the podium. Roger Ward, WLDS. Mr. Stallman, you just mentioned the lawsuit. As we look at some of the EPA, what other policy remedies could be implemented is it an administration or is it going to be a congressional type of action that you would pursue relative to try and get some relief from these EPA regulations? We'll use any mechanism we can, whether it's legislative or, or the regulatory process or litigation. Um, I, I guess in general, the election with the Republican controlled House insulates us now a little bit from having further legislative attempts to put in place burdensome regulations. I'm talking about things like cap and trade uh, uh, for controlling greenhouse gases, or maybe an expansion of the Clean Water Act, you know, to change uh, navig navigable waters to all waters of the United States. So I think that provides us some insulation, but that's, you know, that's defense. Offensively, to pass some legislation to correct some of these things is still gonna be difficult. We may get bills passed in the House to accomplish uh, some of the things we'd like to, and is restricting EPA's activities, and, and uh, just take, for an instance, the NPDES uh, rule about, uh, uh, about permitting uh, spray nozzles or application of, uh, of pesticides over water. Uh, we will still try to seek bipartisan agreements to restrict that type of regulation but passing that legislation is going to be more difficult because obviously you not only have to pass the House, you have to get by a Senate, which is still controlled by the Democrats, and you still have to have a presidential signature. So that's how I kind of view the landscape. Now, there can be opportunities with appropriations to restrict funding for implementation of a lot of these regulations. That's a path that we will pursue also. Uh, so I think we have a lot of opportunities and avenues, but there's nothing that's a magic bullet out there to actually roll back or restrict uh, you know what's already in the regulatory uh, in the regulatory uh, arena now Mr. Solomon, at one of your conferences here Jeff Downey with the Cromwell Leg Network I talked to the commissioner the deputy the former commissioner of ag in Florida that says they were making improvements in the waters of their state and that some of the standards the EPA now have asked them to meet are unattainable and the commissioner from Texas has suggested if they implement what the EPA asked, their environment will worsen rather than improve. How is this an example of what you've seen over the last so many months and what's, what's important about stopping it here before it spreads as a standard across the rest of the states? Well, it's much easier, it's much easier to stop something from expanding, in ter particularly in terms of regulation, than it is to pull it back once it gets out there. I mean, that's, that's number one. Uh, but the extent to which, and, and part of the problem in a lot of the EPA regulatory issues is to the extent EPA can, in essence, coerce 
because of their delegated authority to the states can coerce states into doing things that those states probably wouldn't be doing on their own. And so that tends to be an issue too, and that's a huge issue in the Chesapeake Bay uh, situation. Uh, so I'm not, actually I'm not quite sure about your question, Jeff, but I, in terms of how you try to stop it, the sooner the better, because once you get out into the states, and I'm not sure about the Texas situation where you're, you're saying that, that or our commissioner down there, I say our commissioner, I still live in the state, uh, has said that uh, it, it would make the environment worse. I, if they followed the EPA standards. I'm not, I'm not sure about the details of that. We don't think so in terms of accomplishing environmental goals. I mean, we, uh, we have said all along that too much of this is sort of a command and control regulatory structure that's based on, in this administration, the desires of the environmental community. Whereas if you really want to accomplish good works with agriculture and the environment, you do it the way we've always done it. You do it with voluntary uh, incentive-based programs, of which there are many and of which many producers participate in. We believe agriculture has done a pretty good job of honoring their obligation to the environment, uh, to water, uh, to the soil. Uh, can there be more done? Yes. But that more done should be in the terms of voluntary incentive-based plans as we have done in the past with the many conservation programs that exist, for instance, under the Farm Bill. On the subject of EPA and that lawsuit, one of the things the Obama administration said when they ruled out the Chesapeake Bay rules, for example, is that they were doing this federally because uh, they had seen that the, I think, five or six states in that region plus D.C., in their view, had not made adequate progress in controlling uh, nitrate pollution and other contaminants in the Bay. In your remarks, it seemed like you were suggesting that you felt that this should be a state issue, state regulation of agriculture as opposed to an EPA issue. What about that dynamic? What about in this lawsuit where you have a situation where you have multiple state entities? I mean, was it appropriate for EPA to get involved when you sort of have multiple state governments in the periphery of that bay? Well, first, the Clean Water Act allows states to decide how to improve water quality, and it also allows them to take into, pick, into account economic and social impacts. What EPA was doing, we believe, was just overriding all of that. And you know, I'll, I can't quote the exact figures, but if you look at the Chesapeake Bay and the contentions that the Chesapeake, that the Chesapeake Bay is getting worse, agriculture, when the Chesapeake Bay was supposedly better, constituted a much greater industry sector and much greater activity across the land of the Chesapeake Bay when the Chesapeake Bay was supposed to be better. And now that it's gotten worse, uh, there seems to be some kind of tendency to blame agriculture, and yet the development factor uh, under these rules is going, I mean, or the development, all the development that has occurred, we believe has contributed to a lot more of that pollution. And then the way EPA is proposing those TMDL rules, in essence, uh, it was going to put agriculture in the position of, uh, of bearing a cost burden that they weren't going to be able to bear, and that development probably would over, the, the, the diet, if you will, there'd be an allocation and the diet of that would go toward development as opposed to agriculture. That's why we think agriculture is going to be forced out economically and we don't think uh, that's going to accomplish first what people want to do with cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay and we support cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay and we think agriculture can play a role in that. But that's not the way EPA is going about structuring the rules. 